Good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, today, we're going to have three presentations dealing with cardiac regeneration. The first will be by uh, Peter Buttrick. Uh, Peter did his undergrad at Haverford, his uh, MD degree at Stony Brook, residency at Michael Reese in Chicago, and a cardiology fellowship at Montefiore. Uh, he then joined the faculty at, uh, at Einstein in New York and rose to the rank of tenured professor of medicine and physiology. He then became the section chief of cardiology at the University of Illinois and stayed there until was recruited to Colorado, where he's the Gil Blount Professor and Head of Cardiology Division. He's also the Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Peter is a member of, uh, of the American Association of Physicians. He's the PI of an American Heart Association Center Grant and also the PI of a T32. And uh, he's been, uh, his research interest is molecular and biochemical plasticity of cardiac muscle uh, and some chamber specific changes in response to a variety of stresses. Our second speaker will be Ron Vagnozzi. Uh, he did his undergrad at uh, uh, St. Joseph's in, uh, and a PhD at Thomas Jefferson. Did his postdoc uh, uh, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and uh, is an assistant professor in the Division of Cardiology and a member of the Consortium for Fibrosis Research and Translation. He's the PI of an AHA Center uh, develop, uh, Career Development Grant, and he studies uh, immune responses to injury and stress resulting in fibro fibrotic wound healing. And our third speaker is Kunwa Sung. He did his undergraduate and master's degree in, in China did a master's in cell biology at the University of Arkansas, and then a PhD and a postdoc at UT Southwestern, uh, where uh, he studied cardiac biology and stem cell biology. He's an associate professor in the Division of Cardiology, affiliated with the Gates Center for Regenerative Medicine and Stem Cell Biology, and he's also involved in the Cernic Center, uh, Cernic Institute for Down's Syndrome. He's uh, been awarded an, uh, the Outstanding Early Career Scholar Award from the Department of Medicine, and he's also the PI of an R01. Uh, so Peter, why don't you take it away? Oh, one more thing. <laughs> if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat box uh, and we will get to them at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Rick, and thanks uh, to everybody who's in the virtual audience. Um, uh, we appreciate you coming. This, I think, will be a little unusual um, as a talk. It's going to be um, uh, part scientific and part philosophic. Uh, part of it will be at 30,000 feet, um, and part of it will be uh, nuanced basic science. So hopefully um, there'll be something for everybody. Uh, at the outset, I think there are two messages that uh, we want to transmit. Um, first is that um, there's risk in overzealous pursuit of therapeutic innovation. And second um, is that it's important that there be a solid scientific foundation and collaborative relationships uh, across the discovery uh, continuum if we're going to make um, scientific progress. Uh, for some reason, yes. So um, you're supposed to begin these talks with a structure. Um, so I, like I assume many of you, have spent a lot of the last 12 months reading detective stories. Um, uh, what else can one do? Um, and the, one of the tropes of a detective story is that there's a setup, and then at some point a body is found. Um, and how the body um, got to being dead is, of course, the subject of the detective story. And occasionally, um, you discover that the body isn't dead. Um, that's sort of a film noir uh, trope. And uh, I think that what we're gonna try to do for you today is to uh, show you a, a dead body and then try at the end to revive it. And as we uh, discuss the discussion, as the discussion proceeds, um, I think you'll hear uh, innate discussion of clues as to why the body uh, has been found and why it, it, it might not be dead. So um, for those of you who are murder mystery fans, um, uh, pay careful attention. We're also supposed to begin these uh, talks with a clinical case. So this is a very genetic uh, 
a generic case of a 60 year old who presents with a heart attack, significant left ventricular dysfunction, and subsequently drifts into heart failure. Now that um, sequence is illustrated here. And of course, it's a foundational problem uh, in um, cardiology and has been uh, literally for decades. We've uh, evolved over the year a number of therapeutic strategies to cope with this, um, all of which have been targeted at uh, preserving or reviving um, dead muscle. <clears throat> In the 1950s, what we advocated uh, was strict bed rest. We put people at bed rest for weeks, gave them oxygen in the hope that this would revive the muscle. Uh, this is what we did for Eisenhower um, on this campus, um, and it didn't work very well. In the 1980s, again, in an attempt to revive um, uh, dead or um, hopefully salvageable muscle, we um, treated patients with a combination of glucose, insulin, and potassium with the goal of improving the efficiency of ATP generation, uh, that is to say, altering a substrate utilization, um, and this didn't work very well. Uh, in the 1990s, we actually made strides uh, where we decided that the way to salvage myocardium was actually to reperfuse it, initially with thrombolytics, subsequently with uh, angioplasty. And this resulted in dramatic improvement in muscle function uh, if the intervention was timely, but if it wasn't, um, progressive left ventricular uh, dysfunction ensued. And in fact, we all know this, so I'm hopefully not telling you anything that you don't know. A timely reperfusion of myocardium results uh, is in the bottom two images in salvage of myocardium, but um, non-timely uh, intervention results in myocardial ischemia scar and uh, progressive left ventricular dysfunction. And the proof that this problem is um, with us has not gone away is the fact that um, despite the uh, introduction of angioplasty as a therapeutic strategy in the 1990s, hospitalizations for heart failure continue to rise. The costs of inadequate therapy for this problem, I'll outline because it sets the stage, I think, for what we're going to tell you, is that uh, 8 million Americans have a heart attack annually. The cost of this is $12 billion, and it's the most expensive condition uh, treated in the United States. And a sizable percentage of patients who have heart attacks develop heart failure. Uh, despite all the medical advances that we have uh, chalked up over the past several decades, the prognosis for these patients remains poor. And so given this, it's not surprising, and this underscores a lot of what we're going to talk about today, that there is a great hunger for a novel transformative therapeutic strategy. And to continue the therapeutic strategy discussion, what we're going to talk about today is in the last 20 years or so, uh, it has been proposed that a strategy is stem cell or progenitor cell treatments which restore contractile function in residual myocardial scar tissue. The rationale is um, at least hypothetically clear that if cell-based therapy can help differentiate uh, cells and develop them into adult myocytes, this can replace scar tissue and uh, functional recovery should follow. Uh, the outcome of this strategy we're going to talk about. So as, firstly, as aside from sounding like a great idea, is there any evidence at all that this is a viable strategy? Uh, so the first question that one might ask is, can myocytes divide? Uh, so if you're a fish or you're a salamander, the answer is an enthusiastic yes. And the picture is of a zebra fish, a remarkable um, a model for the, this for uh, investigating cardiac development. In a zebrafish, you can literally cut the heart in half and it will regenerate. Uh, the same is largely true, as it turns out, of salamanders. Um, however, it's not true of, of mammals. Uh, from the standpoint of rodents, you can do great damage to the heart um, uh, in utero, uh, to fetal heart, and the heart will recover. But once birth occurs, um, the general presumption is that that's all the cardiocytes you get and damage results in scar. Uh, it's not surprising that this is the case. The picture that I'm showing you now is um, an adult terminally differentiated cardiomyocyte, which is a very complicated cellular structure. 
It's binucleate. It has very complicated sarcomeres and very well-defined and well-differentiated cell-cell contacts. And the consensus for decades has been that the cardiocyte cell number is fixed at birth and declines over the course of a lifetime. So uh, balanced against this um, generally accepted dogma in the 19, late 1990s and in the early 2000s, a counter hypothesis began to develop. Um, and this um, is one of the foundational principles or the foundational papers that um, led to the cell therapies that we're gonna talk about. This is a paper that was published in PNAS in 1998. Similar studies were published by the same group over the next a decade or so, and claimed to show that there was myocyte mitosis uh, in vivo uh, in the setting of a myocardial infarction, and that mitosis occurred uh, for predominantly in the border zone of the infarct, but to a lesser degree in the distant myocardium. And the picture uh, is uh, presumed to be a cardiocyte dividing. So that was sort of a bombshell because it, it uh, called into question dogma that had existed um, in the literature for some time and was uh, to some degree a paradigm shifting concept. Now balanced against this was a great deal of data um, which did not duplicate that observation. Um, people looked really hard and were unable to demonstrate significant um, myocyte mitosis. And I show you this paper only because I think it's just extraordinary. Um, it's not, it just is an extraordinary piece of work. And it was essentially a naturally occurring pulse chase experiment. In the 1960s, um, we did nuclear tests in the atmosphere. Uh, most of you are probably too young to remember this. In the 1970s, they went underground. But as a result of nuclear testing in the atmosphere, um, people who were in the general vicinity of nuclear tests absorbed carbon-14. And that's shown in the panel on the upper left. Uh, when you did autopsies, carbon-14 has the virtue of being a very long-lived um, uh, isotope. Uh, so it's possible it sticks around in the heart or in any organ for a long period of time and essentially labels the nuclei in individuals that were exposed to nuclear testing and allows one to do essentially a naturally occurring experiment on whether cells are actually undergoing division. Uh, in the bottom is the average DNA content in cardiac myocytes in the hearts of individuals at the time of autopsy who were exposed to uh, atmospheric nuclear testing. And the finding here is that there is no change in DNA content per cell over the course of a lifetime. If cells were dividing, if there was a nascent uh, immature population of cells, this would not be a stable curve. Uh, these same people also looked at myocyte um, a turnover and the total number of myocytes in the hearts of individuals that um, were autopsied. And the general finding is that there was a limited amount of myocyte turnover in people that were very young, and this declined to essentially zero uh, as you got older. And if you looked at cardiocyte number, uh, you lose cardiocytes over the course of a lifetime. So by the time you're uh, 60 or 70 years old, you have um, uh, only about 60 or 70% of the cardiocytes uh, that you were born with. And if you look at the morphology of the nuclei in these cells, the, 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 the uh, nuclei become uh, senescent over time. So this strongly argues against the fact that the heart has inherent regenerative uh, properties insofar as the myocytes are concerned. Uh, in contrast, other cells uh, are not the same. The heart has a number of different cell populations and the C14 labeling also occurred in mesenchymal and endothelial cells. And in the bottom on the left, you can see that um, there was actually some um, increase in cell number of mesenchymal cells and endothelial cells. And uh, in parallel, there was some turnover of these cell populations but basically nothing insofar as cardiomyocytes uh, were concerned. So uh, if there's very limited capacity for cardiac myocyte division, what about exogenous administration of pluripotent stem cells? Is this a strategy for regenerating myocardium? Uh, 
and the same group that I uh, showed you before that demonstrated the dividing uh, myocyte also looked at this question, and this is an experiment that got a huge amount of press at the time, where they gave animals uh, infarcts, uh, and in some of the animals they uh, treated them in a fashion so as to stimulate uh, the bone marrow. And if you look at the upper left, you can see that in the animals that were not stimulated, labeled MI, there was a loss of viable myocytes, an increase in dysfunctional um, myocytes in that cell population. But in the animals in whom bone marrow was stimulated, they claimed to have found a, set, a third population of nascent cardiocytes that presumably were um, uh, regenerating myocardium. Uh, on the right, um, they actually did mechanical measurements and showed that in the animals that were where the bone marrow was treated, the wall thickness uh, was greater in the um, area of scar and ejection fraction improved, uh, suggesting that real functional implications of this bone marrow stimulation. Uh, again, this was a transformative um, moment um, and uh, an attempt at shifting the paradigm to suggest that you could instill um, cells into the heart and they had regenerative capacity. Uh, balanced against this uh, was a whole uh, body of literature from many different laboratories. I show you this just as one example um, of a group that injected directly into the heart several different uh, cell types that were presumably pluripotent. Uh, these cell types were labeled with a green fluorescent protein and then they were monitored to see if green fluorescent protein uh, tracked with myocyte specific markers. Uh, that's shown in red. And what this slide demonstrates that is in no, in no cell types were they able to show coincidence of a myocyte marker along with a green fluorescent protein tag, uh, suggesting that pluripotent cells do not transdifferentiate into myocytes in vivo. But this is a clue, which is that despite this, there was modest improvement seen in left ventricular function at 10 and 30 days following injection. So a somewhat surprising and discordant finding. And we're going to come back to this uh, as the talk progresses. So uh, there was a whole proliferation of studies uh, that took place um, at the level of the mouse and the rat where all sorts of different cells were injected into the heart, bone marrow cells, circulating cells, cells isolated from the heart that were postulated to have um, pluripotent potential. And uh, you can see some of the experimental cell types that were injected. And some of these studies claimed that there was some transdifferentiation and limited cardiac regeneration, but the definitive identification of nascent cardiocytes uh, was difficult to demonstrate. Um, the, 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 the joke at the time um, was uh, a lot of green cells, not a whole lot of cardiocytes. And Ron's going to talk a little bit more about this as we go forward. But surprisingly, um, a lot of these studies where needles were injected into the heart and cells um, infused uh, showed a variable but demonstrable functional improvement after myocardial infarction and injury. So there was a consistent disconnect between uh, the demonstration of nascent viable myocytes and um, recovery of cell function. So it's worth noting, and I think this uh, gets to some degree to the philosophical things we're going to talk about today. All of the studies that I've described were relatively small. All of the animal models were not models that we, we traditionally think of as preclinical. These are all mice and rats. The techniques of cell delivery, the cell numbers delivered, were highly, highly variable, although mostly they involved direct injection into scar margins. And I think the fact that there was such variability in um, the techniques used is one of the um, things that really muddies the water as we go forward. Generally, the demonstration of new mature cardiocytes in, in repopulated myocardium was not consistent and at best was rare. Uh, you could find nascent populations of me mesenchymal and endothelial cells. And really critically, functional improvement, which was documented in many of these studies, did not correlate with the demonstration of nascent cell populations. The, um, the, the, the uh, dis discussion around this point sort of digressed uh, 
into whether or not this was a paracrine phenomena or whether in fact we were limiting scar expansion by just injecting a boatload of cells into a scar. And both of those hypotheses were out there but never uh, comprehensively investigated. So despite ambiguous non-reproducible preclinical data, there followed an explosion of clinical trials. Uh, here's uh, an example of um, what that looked like. The trials were to some degree initiated by the papers that I showed you at the, uh, at the outset, uh, suggesting that bone marrow cells can regenerate uh, infarcted myocardium uh, and that uh, infarcted myocardium could be repaired by um, injection of uh, intracoronary myocytes. Uh, and again, trials proliferated, but in the background, there was a, a huge uh, hue and cry uh, about this. And many investigators, um, uh, Lauren Field um, and a number of others um, claimed that this was just nonsense. Uh, and that, uh, hemo for example, hematopoietic cells became hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cells became hematopoietic tissue and not myocardium. Uh, finally, uh, the results of these trials began to be reported. Um, this is uh, a, a study called the BAMI trial. B stands for bone marrow. AMI stands for acute myocardial infarction. Uh, and this was at, at the time one of the larger studies. Um, and the result was um, uh, it's, it was the largest trial at the time, had unexpectedly low recruitment, low event rates, and there were no meaningful group comparisons uh, that could be made to distinguish the uh, animals, the people that were injected uh, with um, precursor cells uh, from those that were injected or that were not injected. And in fact, there emerged a meta-analyses of a lot of these stem cell trials, um, 41. Um, there are additional trials that are still ongoing. Uh, one is recruiting at our institution, which I think has um, some value, and we can talk about it in the Q&A period if you want. But of the 41 trials, uh, this included more than 2,000 participants. About 1,200 received cell-based therapy. And the cell-based therapy came, as I showed you in the previous slide, in multiple sizes and shapes, um, including fact sorted autologous marrow cells. Um, and there were multiple study designs and delivery strategies. The conclusions of this meta analysis was this is safe. The studies were well executed. There was no significant change in mortality or morbidity, but there was no uh, significant clinical impact. Uh, ejection fraction did not change. And no data that were presented, even through meta-analysis, uh, reached uh, sample size numbers that were sufficient to support any meaningful positive conclusions. Uh, to make matters worse, um, 31 publications from the laboratory of Piero Anversa, whose um, work I showed you uh, at the outset that launched this field to some degree, uh, the papers were retracted. Um, Harvard University paid 10 million bucks to the NIH in fines for research impropriety, and the NIH paused a major stem cell trial, um, which involved administration of a combination of cells as regenerative therapy. Uh, an editorial written by John Epstein at the time um, summarized, I think, what was the consensus that emerged which was that after 17 years of study and literally millions and millions of dollars of research investment, the totality of the data fails to support significant clinical benefit and critically no clear mechanism of action uh, could be supported with rigorous data. So how did we get here and what lessons should we take away? So I'm now presenting you with the dead body. Uh, so I think uh, the takeaways, and to some degree this is philosophical, um, and I think one takeaway is that publication bias is real, uh, and peer review, even in the highest impact journals, is imperfect. We want to publish high impact studies that are uh, paradigm shifting. But reproducibility or validation of the results in multiple laboratories is critical, especially when we're uh, contemplating paradigm shifting results. Animal models, and Ron is going to talk about this, experimental techniques, cell preparations can introduce unanticipated confounders, and appreciating those confounders actually 
can provide us with a path forward if we're if we're um, if we're sufficiently attentive uh, to appreciate what they are. And I think insofar as it's possible, enthusiasm for novel biology should be tempered by ruthless analytic dissection. The other thing that I think it's important to say is that scientific discovery is not linear. We actually learned a lot and hopefully we can convince you that even from this morass of contradictory data that, that will present, there actually is some truth. It's just, it's not linear. You don't go from a single observation to a conclusion and then from that conclusion to the next conclusion. You sort of have to meander to get to truth. From a clinical standpoint, um, I think this is actually very important. Major clinical investments need to be based on solid scientific foundations. The amount of money that was invested in um, uh, startup companies that were uh, that were driven by uh, some of these uh, findings is astounding. And I think it's very clear that investors, uh, both industry and federal investors, the NIH was not without blame, and the public are very impatient. They're very eager for a return on investment and very goal-oriented. We began this talk by outlining what was a single critical problem in cardiology that's plagued us for 70 years, and it would be wonderful if we could solve this problem. I think the other finding that I want to stress is that forward inertia is very difficult to stop. One might reasonably have said after a couple of negative trials, it's time to go back to first principles and think about why these aren't working. But instead, what was done was we made small tweaks to the clinical trials in the hope that they would be positive rather than questioning the fundamental foundation. And that's just a forward inertial problem. People want to make progress. However, I think the hero in this story is the clinical trial design. Um, all of the clinical trials, insofar as I can see and insofar as um, dispassionate observers can see, were very, very carefully executed. They all had very uh, well-designed data safety and monitoring committees, and they were all, as I said, largely negative. And I think that we can take some pride as a profession in the fact that that provided an ultimate reality check, albeit it was maybe a dozen years and several hundred million dollars too late. So that's where I want to leave you, um, but I, with a, what essentially is a dead body. But the story doesn't end here. Um, and I want to introduce my colleagues, uh, Ron Vagnozzi and Kunwa Song, who are going to try to at least uh, provide um, information that suggests that, again, there is still real opportunity to reset and to reimagine cardiac uh, regeneration based to some degree on what we've learned, but also based on going back to first principles and thinking carefully about the science. So I'm now turning the floor over to Ron. It's on you, Ron. Thank you, Peter. And uh, it's a real privilege to, to get to present some of our work. So my training is in cardiovascular basic science, uh, and particularly in using animal models to, to understand mechanisms of cardiac disease. And you've already heard uh, a number of the clues that we talked about regarding stem cell therapy in the heart. And just to set the stage, I came into the, to this field about seven or eight years ago right when things were really hitting their peak controversy. So some of the, the things that you've heard about, we didn't know yet, but what we really knew as a field and what the basic scientists among the group were struggling with was this idea that one, all the different cell types that you, you've seen here and you, you've seen this slide uh, a few minutes ago, all of these cell types were proposed to improve heart function if they were injected into animal models uh, and in some cases in, in cl large clinical trials. Um, and so it wasn't clear how this was working. And the other really big question was, is the heart a regenerative organ? So you, you've seen some evidence that was put forth that the heart can renew itself uh, from a stem cell source. And this was actually very important to the concept of using stem cells to regenerate heart muscle. If the heart has its own stem cell, then the notion was that much like a bone marrow transplant can repopulate the bone marrow, you could isolate those stem cells from the heart and re-inject them at larger numbers uh, as a therapy. So these were the questions that the field was struggling with. And I'll try to tell you a little bit about how we use rodent models uh, and genetic tools in the mouse to address some of these points. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. 
Uh, so to understand a little bit of what I'll show you, I just need to briefly touch on the, the tools that we use in the lab. And what I've spent a number of years studying and working on is genetic lineage tracing. And so not to belabor the details, but in general, what this allows us to do is use genetic tools in the mouse to label cells with a fluorescent protein uh, like GFP, which is shown here in green. And then that's a permanent label that allows those cells to be tracked over time with imaging. And if, for example, if you see here with the arrowhead, that green cell is, uh, is a stem cell, a cartoon schematic. And if that cell turns into a cardiomyocyte, that myocyte is still green. Uh, and an important point here is that this is different than using labeled cells that you're injecting back into an organism, which you saw an example of previously. Here, we're not otherwise manipulating the system at all. We're not isolating these cells. We're not putting them into culture and changing their properties. This is just a, a genetic tool that we can use in an intact animal to label those cells endogenously without altering their, their properties. And the readout that you really get from this, as you can see on the right, is a, is a micrograph, a fluorescence micrograph, uh, which is showing all cardiomyocytes in red. And you can see this striated pattern. And then that one green myocyte uh, is one that possibly came from a stem cell lineage. So this is, these are one of the key tools that we've used. Um, next slide. And so we use this to answer really a fundamental question. Does the heart have its own stem cell? And at the time, there were certain populations of cells uh, that were proposed to be cardiac stem cells, predominantly C-kit cells, which were put forth by the Inversa lab and a few others that you've heard about. And so the idea was, can we use this system to answer the question, does a C-kit cell ever turn into a cardiomyocyte in a mouse? And long story short, it really doesn't. So again, you can see some examples here with uh, immunofluorescence showing that one green myocyte amongst the dozens and, and hundreds of thousands of others. Uh, and we use the system to actually determine the rate of how many times we could detect a cell that possibly came from a, a C-kit, uh, a myocyte that came from a C-kit cell. And you can see on the right, the graph showing the percentages of myocytes that came from this origin is, predominant, is preposterously too low for it to be a, an endogenous stem cell. If you think about tissues that are known to regenerate from a stem cell source, uh, it obviously would not make sense for the, for the heart to have a cell that could only contribute 0.005% of new myocytes. Uh, and we did this at baseline and after injury, and essentially these cells very rarely turn into myocytes. Uh, we did this with another system where we looked at uh, SCA1 cells. This was another flavor of, of cardiac stem cell that had been proposed. Uh, and so we used the same sort of genetic system in the mouse to label SCA1 cells. This is stem cell antigen one. And we found again that we could detect very, very low rates of, of myocytes, cardiomyocytes that, would, that had that genetic label suggesting they came from a, a, a SCA1 source. And so after this, uh, our papers came out, there were a number of other groups that did even more comprehensive studies uh, in rodent models and we're able to show that really the heart does not, the adult uh, mammalian heart does not repopulate itself from a stem cell source, which in hindsight seems like a fairly well understood principle, but at the time was heavily debated. Um, so the other real big question that was in the field at the time was that we had all this preclinical data that, you, that you've heard a little bit about, about injecting these all different types of cells into an infarcted heart in rodent models and even in some large animal studies. And by and large, they seem to produce some degree of functional benefit. So if you, if you infarct the heart and inject these cells, you've got a, a small functional improvement, maybe a change in ventricular remodeling. Uh, and if, if it's not due to making new muscle, how does this work? How, do, how are the, all these different cell types, almost regardless of their origin, all giving this transient functional benefit? And you can see here just a few of the examples of what was being proposed at the time. Perhaps these cells turn into vessels or turn into other cell types, we and others have shown that that really doesn't occur, or perhaps they act by a paracrine mechanism where they stimulate endogenous repair. So that was the other big question in the field. Is that, is that really how this cell therapy works? So that's what we try to address, uh, and, and again, using a mouse model. And we did a, a pretty simple, I think a pretty simple experiment. Uh, we just took normal wild type mice that had no injury, no myocardial infarction, and we injected the most commonly used uh, stem cell type, these mononuclear cells, those bone marrow cells that had been used in a large number of trials. And we just did this into healthy animals and, saw, and said, what does that affect? What does that do to the heart? What kind of effect do we see? Do they turn into muscle? Do they turn into vessels? Um, turns out what they really do, and not, perhaps not surprisingly, is they cause an immune response. And so when you directly inject these cells into the heart, 
Uh, we did immunofluorescence to show basically in, in green, you can see cardiac macrophages get recruited around the area where the cells were injected. And again, we can use the genetic tools we have to label those cells in red and show that they actually persist for a few days, not very long, don't turn into muscle, don't really turn into anything, but they cause this profound immune reaction. Uh, and if we can go forward one slide. So we wanted to know if that immune reaction was the key to this mechanism. And so to, to do that, we developed a compound, or we used a compound that mimics the immune response, but that it's not a cell. Uh, and so this is a, a compound called zymosin. It's actually part of a yeast backbone. It's, it's a highly inflammatory compound. It's not a cell. And so when we inject zymosin, we get the same response. We get that local inflammation. Uh, and so we could use this as a way of asking, is this immune response really how all these cells are working? Uh, next slide. So this is the, really the, the big take home message. So we did uh, a model of ischemia reperfusion in the mouse, mimicking heart attack. And then after one week, we injected either stem cells, these MNCs, these proposed stem cells, or we injected zymosin, an inflammatory compound. And uh, what's shown in the, in the graphs on the right is cardiac function. So we can use echocardiography to measure function in mice, much like uh, is what's done clinically. And again, the take home message is that if you look at the bars in blue or yellow, both cell therapy and inflammatory therapy gave the same benefit. And so you really don't even need the stem cell. You can just get, if you get that immune response, you get the benefit. Uh, and we did a number of other experiments, which I won't show you uh, on the left. There's a few more points. Um, if we could advance. <clears throat> we also showed that you actually don't need these cells to be viable. Uh, again, the concept in the, in the field at the time was that when you inject cells, they secrete paracrine factors or they otherwise uh, modulate the, the healing response. But it turns out the cells themselves don't even have to be functional. Uh, and we also showed just very briefly that if we suppress the immune response systemically uh, or by targeting macrophages, which we think are the key cell type involved here, uh, we could block the benefit of both cell therapy or this inflammatory stimulus. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> and so then in the very last few minutes, I'll just briefly touch on some other key points about why we think using these animal models can inform uh, and provide important mechanistic information that could be used for clinical trial design. Uh, and so one of the really big obstacles to translating this concept into the clinic was that in the animal studies that we and many others were doing, cells were usually injected straight into the heart, into the infarct area, or sometimes into the heart right at the time of ischemia, so before there was even any injury. This is obviously very challenging to do in, in clinical pr uh, practice, and so often what happens is that you, in these trials, you would see uh, cells being infused systemically, uh, either intravenous infusion or intracoronary uh, with the notion being that these would somehow home to the area of damage. Uh, and we were able to show, at least in, in mouse, that this does not occur. And so what we did is we actually either infused or injected uh, MNCs, bone marrow cells. And you can see in the uh, pink uh, box on the left that if you inject cells, we were able to show, again, we do get that transient benefit. Um, but if we infuse them, even if we infuse them at 10 times the dose, they still did not improve function. And we were able to show, again, using histology, that these cells really never make it into the heart. And when they do, they seem to get stuck in the capillaries. So they're not even accessing the area of tissue where they're proposed to work. Uh, and then the next thing we also wanted to point out, and this is a, a paper in revision, often in clinical practice, you're dealing with therapy, uh, attempts at therapy with chronic scar, with patients who've had MI and who are often months or eight years after damage. This is not what happens in preclinical animal models. You're usually injecting into animals that have had a surgically induced infarct, but it's usually within the first days to weeks. And so it's a very different cellular context. And we also found that if you do this and then you inject cells into a chronic scar, you also no longer are able to improve function. And we think part of this is because the actual matrix, the extracellular matrix, the, the cellular composition of the scar itself is quite different. And so this is something we think is important going forward. If we're going to use any kind of uh, cell therapy-based approaches for clinical trial, you really have to understand the context and the actual mechanism of action. And we think animal models are a way to learn a lot about that. Um, so last slide. I think that what I'd like to briefly touch on is that the heart is non-regenerative. The adult mammalian heart is non-regenerative. It does not have its own stem cell. Uh, we think that rodent models can really help us learn about the basic mechanisms that can inform clinical trial design. Uh, 
Uh, and what my lab is interested in, what I'm really excited about is finding ways to modulate wound healing and perhaps even take advantage of the benefits of, of a small amount of, it, of inflammation as a way to, to uh, impart healing effects on the infarcted heart. Uh, and I'll just briefly say that if anyone's more interested in hearing about some of this, there was a nice editorial in the New England Journal uh, about some of the work I showed. But this is only, again, one side of the story. And often in the case of scarring, you have progressive chronic fibrosis. And so for the last bit, I'll turn uh, the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Kun Hwa Song, who will tell you, tell you a little bit about how he's approached this problem. Thank you, Ron. Uh, so in, in a recent review paper published in Cell Stem Cell last year, three potential biomedical approach proposed for heart regeneration. So uh, Peter and Ron talked about uh, enhancement of cardiomyocyte proliferation and a stem cell-based cell therapy. In the next few, few, few minutes, I'm going to focus on direct reprogramming. Next, please. So after, after heart attack, the massive cardiomyocyte will die, but uh, the cardiac fibroblast uh, interstitial cell in myocardium will be activated. So activated uh, cardiac fibroblast continues to divide and uh, secrete matrix protein, which leads to cardiac scar tissue formation, which impairs cardiac pump function. So the idea of cardiac reprogramming is to regenerate cardiac myocyte by switch the cell fate of this big pool of cardiac fibroblast into cardiac myocyte cell fate. So in myocardium, cardiac myocyte and the cardiac myocyte couple with each other by connexin 43, a gap junction, and the cardiac fibroblast also electrically coupled with the surrounding cardiac myocyte. So this coupling among different cell type is a very crucial for rhythmic contraction of the heart. If a newly regenerated cardiac myocyte cannot electrically couple with surrounding cardiac myocyte, cardiac arrhythmia could happen. So the cardiac reprogramming targets in situ cardiac fibroblast. If we can turn this cardiac fibroblast into the different cell fate, like a cardiac myocyte, this newly regenerated cardiac myocyte naturally electrically coupled with surrounding cardiac myocyte, which can, could prevent cardiac arrhythmia after regeneration in the heart. So cellular reprogramming, the concept of this approach has been established for several decades. One outstanding example is the reprogramming of fibroblasts into induced pluripotent stem cells or iPS cells, established by Dr. Shimaya, Shinya Yamanaka and his colleagues in 2006. So this induced pluripotent stem cells or iPS cells are the same as uh, embryonic stem cells that are capable of differentiating into any type of cells in the body. Since then, it has been shown that fibroblasts also can be reprogrammed into other terminally differentiated cells, such as the neurons. We and the others have also shown that fibroblasts can be reprogrammed into cardiac myocytes. So uh, since 2010, there are many, many different approach have been developed in different laboratories for reprogramming mouse fibroblasts into cardiac myocyte. So all these approaches are derived from two basic different methods, GMT method and the GHAT method, which were established in 2010 and the 2012 respectively. So many laboratory, including us uh, highlighted here, uh, put a lot of efforts to optimize this method, trying to get a, a best method to highly turn on the cardiomyocyte sulfate 
in cardiofibroblast population. So currently, the best method can switch about 70 to 80 percent of both cardiofibroblasts into a cardiomyocyte cellfish in cultural dish. So the studies during the past decades also show that heart regeneration outcomes in vivo likely correlates with the reprogramming efficiency of this approach in vitro. For example, GMT can, can uh, reprogram around 10 to 20% of cardiofibrovas into cardiomyocyte. Injection of this cocktail in, into the myocardium after myocardial infarction increased the cardiac function shown here, ejection fraction by five to 10%. GHMT method can reprogram around more than 50% of cardiac fibroblasts into cardiomyocyte. Injection of a GHMT into myocardium following heart attack increased the cardiac function by around 20%. So this data suggests that if we can find a, a way efficiently reprogram a, a mouse or human cardiofibroblasts into a cardiomyocyte in cultural dish, we'll have a better chance to be successful in vivo for heart regeneration. So uh, even though we can successfully or efficiently switch the mouse cardiofibrous cell fate into a cardiomyocyte, can we directly transform this method to human? The answer is probably not because there are many differences between human cardiomyocyte and the mouse cardiomyocyte. For example, mouse cardiomyocyte with the alpha methane heavy chain, a fast contractor myofibril protein, can beat 600 beats per minute, but a human cardiomyocyte can only beat 70 times per minute. A human heart is composed of uh, about 25% by nuclear ATP cardiomyocyte, but a mouse heart is composed of 90% uh, by nuclear ATP cardiomyocyte. Electrophysiologically, human cardiomyocyte also have, has a much longer action potential duration than mouse cardiomyocyte. Next. Sorry, we're stuck, but I'll get us moving. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, because of the difference between these two different type of um, myocyte, the approach we shown previously successfully switch the cell fate of a mouse cardiofibroblast into cardiomyocyte doesn't really work well in human cardiac fibroblast. Even though many laboratory have put efforts into this, but currently the best method can only induce about 10 to 12% of a human cardiofibroblast expressing some cardiomyocyte markers, a very, very small fraction, less than 1% of these cells completely adopt a human cardiomyocyte identity. So one barrier for human cardiomyocyte, cardiac regeneration or cardiac uh, reprogramming is the uh, availability of a large amount of human cardiofibroblast. We can isolate a primary human cardiofibroblast from heart biopsy, but this primary human cardiofibroblast cannot be expanded to, to a large number because of uh, proliferation silence after several passages in cultural dish. So in our lab, we use a, a human IPSC platform to overcome this uh, um, problem. Human iPS cell can unlimited differentiate, it, it, it proliferate, and also different can be induced 
to differentiate into any cell type what we want. For example, human cardiac fibroblast. In addition, we can easily engineer or manipulate human genome in human iPS cells. So this provides us a tool to study mechanism related to the human uh, cardiac reprogramming. So we use a larger amount of a human cardiac fibroblasts derived from human iPSA to perform the systematic approach to search for the best way or to efficiently turn off, turn off the cardiac fibroblast identity in cell population and turn on the cardiac myocyte um, cell fate switch and to generate a cardiac myocyte from cardiac fibroblast. So after we establish a good method or efficient method in cultural dish, we would like to use this uh, to apply this method in bigger animal or preclinical animal models to test uh, the efficacy. Next, Peter. Okay. Um, so um, thank you, Kunwa. Thank you, Ron. Um, I want to just end with a couple of conclusions that I think um, should fall out of this discussion. Um, First, I hope we've convinced you um, that cardiac regeneration repair is not dead, uh, but the premise that this will be driven by cardiac progenitor cells is a lost cause. Second, I think, um, and I, we've alluded to this, that things are not always as they seem. The limited success of preclinical trials did not reflect myocyte expansion. But I think it's much more likely that they reflected immune modulation of wound healing. So there's a lesson to be learned there and also a path, um, a therapeutic path forward. In combination, I think an additional very attractive path forward might involve manipulation of fibroblast lineage determination. And this, as Kunwa has elegantly shown, can be done via gene delivery of carefully constructed family of transcription factors. And this strategy um, is uh, definitely in development, not only here, but at other institutions around the country. I think finally, cell culture and mouse models are excellent platforms for biologic investigation and for proof of concept. But I think we got off track a little bit uh, over the course of the last 20 years by relying on data that was generated in mice and preclinical models um, and clinically applicable strategies of therapy delivery are necessary going forward. And finally, and this is, if anything, uh, my personal North Star and um, a lesson and a message that I would love to transmit to everybody in the audience. And that is that basic scientists and clinicians need to engage with each other in order to navigate this particular problem, but also other complex uh, scientific problems. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure and we're happy um, to field questions. Okay, well, thanks to all three speakers. That was uh, uh, very engaging, very informative. We have time for a few questions. Uh, one that I would like to ask is, while the focus is on trying to increase the number of uh, uh, cardiomyocytes. Has there been any work trying to decrease the fibrotic response to the injury um, uh, such that maybe you don't need as many uh, uh, myocardial fibro uh, myocardiocytes? Uh, I'll take a crack at that and then I think um, both Kunwa and Ron can speak. One of the things that Kunwa has shown is that when you're trying to get uh, fibroblasts to differentiate into myocytes, one of the uh, factors that you can use involves inhibiting TGF beta, which is to say if you diminish the drive to form scar, you increase the drive um, to form um, uh, myocytes. So I think that speaks at least indirectly to your question. Yeah. And then I think Ron's uh, data, and again, Ron can speak up, I don't want to speak for him, suggests that um, uh, immune modulation of factors that drive scar formation, 
may actually be very uh, beneficial. I'll let Kun Wan Ron add something if, if, if they want to. Uh, just to clarify the question, if you have a, a, an ischemic reproducible injury, ligation of a coronary artery, et cetera, um, and you get, uh, I, I assume that scar formation begins and progresses over time, uh, but I don't know that for certain, so I'd like you to comment on that. And the second, and, and if it does progress, over what, what does it ever stop progressing? Uh, <laughs> is, is there a point at which uh, the, the scar is, is finite? Hey, Ron, you want to take that one? Sure. So great, great questions. And I think the answer sort of touches on some of the limitations between animal models and, and, and clinical practices. In the, in the animal models that we use, the scar formation is relatively well characterized, but it's it's an extreme example. And so the, the models that we use of myocardial infarction or even reperfused ischemia, they cause pretty strong amount of damage to the heart, something that you know normally you would never see in a patient. Uh, but with that model, we can actually relatively well define the progression of scar. And so in, in mice, for example, in, in the data I showed you, typically the, the actual scar itself is formed within the first one to two weeks after the injury. And then there is a phase of sort of remodeling and progression that occurs after that, but it's not sort of the peak scar expansion has already occurred. So in mice, we're talking on the order of weeks. Um, as far as finding ways to modulate that, that's you know a huge goal for a lot of groups. One of the things uh, that I'm really interested in is, and I didn't get a chance to show this, but we think that certain populations of macrophages actually suppress fibrosis. And so it becomes a delicate balance because you need a certain amount of scarring to actually allow the heart to stay functional, to repair the damage, and then you need it to stop. And so what we're really interested in is figuring out how to get that stopping point to happen. Um, because the heart doesn't regenerate itself, there's constant damage signals going on, and that tends to propagate the scarring. So I'm really interested in modulating the, the, the immune side of things and sort of finding if there is an anti-fibrotic macrophage, for example, uh, but it's it's complicated. Um, Kunwa, what, what do you what do you think? Yeah, I think they uh, I, I agree uh, with what you and the Peter said. So the animal model is so different from humans. So like in animal uh, models, so you um, heart attack induce about a forty even to fifty percent of scar tissue in left ventricle. This mice still can survive for like a twelve months or even more than that. Uh, but in human, Peter probably knows uh, how severe <laughs> if the heart get that. It's a big and, uh, problem. <laughs> yeah, and also the scar once scar fo uh, formed, this scar tissue will stiffen the heart, probably really impair the heart contraction. Yeah, diastolic dysfunction. Uh, a couple of questions quickly from the uh, the, the audience. Uh, one person asks. Are, uh, is the number of cardias, cardiomyocytes that are present at birth the same number that are present uh, uh, at maturity? Um, you know, the first, the first decade of life is a little bit labile, but pretty soon after birth, that's all you get. Um, and then there's a gradual decline. The number that's quoted is you lose about 1% of the cardiocytes uh, per year after age 40. So those in the audience who yeah. are older than 40, um, you're on the way out. Um, but there is some, some liability in the first decade of life. Um, another question, is the uh, immune stimulation that uh, you talked about specific for zymosin, or could it, would it occur like with LPS or other uh, immune stimulation uh, mechanisms? Yeah, that, so that's a great question. That's something we're working on. Uh, Zymosin sort of came to us somewhat serendipitously as we were doing these experiments. There were a couple papers showing that it could it could stimulate neonatal cardiac proliferation, uh, which Peter talked a little bit about. And so we we chose Zymosin as a model to try that and see if we would get any kind of reparative effect. Uh, we haven't tried it with LPS or other inflammatory stimuli, so it's something that we're interested in. Uh, I think it, the, the stimulus does matter, and I think the the, the duration of it matters too. Um, for whatever reason, when we use this zymosin compound, it tends to cause the 
the initial influx of immune cells and then it, it dampens out. It, it, so the, 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 the tissue actually clears it. And I think that, again, serendipitously, that's perhaps why these stem cell therapies might have given the effects they did, because when these cells get injected, they don't persist. Uh, they don't really engraft, which was the initial concept. So the fact that they sort of go in, essentially die, cause an immune reaction, and then get cleared is probably important because persistent inflammation, as you might think, would be bad. Um, so again, it's an example of perhaps uh, a circular way of discovering something, but uh, we think it's important to, to think about the timing and the duration and the type of stimulus. So it, it's complicated, and I hope it's what's going to keep me in business for some time. <laughs> uh, we have... It's uh, 12 o'clock. I'll just close by saying I was struck by uh, some of the philosophical comments Peter made in his section uh, as it pertained to the um, um, promulgation of interventions for COVID uh, <laughs> early on. Um, uh, many false starts in the, in, the, uh, in the attempt to do something because people wanted to do something, not including bleach and, uh, and, uh, and other treatments. Well, anyway, all three of you, thank you very much. Very stimulating uh, Grand Rounds. Appreciate your uh, participation. And thanks everyone for coming. Our pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks so much.